good morning. Today we have David Zhang again, back to back. This time with uh, package development for GG transcript. Uh, thanks for um, presenting, David. No worries. Um, thanks again for the for the intro and and having me here. Um, today I, I kind of wanted to just kind of um, a, a little bit of spreading the word, but mostly get your feedback um, as potential users of a trend uh, of a package that I've been very recently sort of developing. Um, the, the package is called ggtranscript and it's kind of an extension of ggplot2 and um, attempting to simplify the way that we can visualize transcript annotation. I, I hope that Kind of this is a feature that um, some of you will come across during your sort of uh, work and hopefully um, because the sort of package is still undergoing development, um, although the most core features that I've thought about are, are now implemented, there's definitely room if you guys think of sort of um, additional things that you would like to be added in this sort of package or uh, even things to do with like the API not seeming consistent or uh, unintuitive when you use it. Kind of any feedback along those lines would be greatly appreciated and I can definitely kind of go back and incorporate that. Um, so yeah, uh, apologies that today's sort of presentation isn't going to be super um, fully fleshed out. Uh, uh, um, as I mentioned, it's Kind of still in development and i'm pretty much going to take you through a very preliminary vignette about uh, uh gg gg transcript but here i just wanted to first kind of conceptualize a little bit of my thinking around um developing the package and um th the reason that i came across this actually is because in our lab we have a lot of people working on long long read um um sort of uh analyses and discovery of, of novel transcripts and one thing that we were finding is that at some point we wanted to visualize these sort of full length transcript structures and it wasn't that easy to do so, although you could sort of hack the, um, the existing base ggplot functions to do so. Um, and then there were other sort of um, use cases coming up, such as in, in, uh, in sort of diagnostics where you wanted to visualize a transcript to see what changes had happened in, in a patient. Um, and uh, and also just to kind of visualize, for example, cage seek data or like methylation data on top of existing transcript structures. So then it kind of came about that you know GG transcript could be a sort of underlying solution to to to, to all of these things and um, and and try to kind of improve the ease of which we could could plot transcripts. Um, then, uh, so, so this is sort of a, a little bit of a kind of flow diagram that just describes how the, the package is laid out, or at least my, my thinking behind it. Um, I, I introduce four new geomes into, into sort of the extending ggplot side. And the, the core two geomes really that are needed um, to visualize transcript structures are, 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 are geom intron and, and geom range, which I'll kind of show a little bit more about later. And these sort of derive from, from um, or inherit uh, fr from the kind of ggplot um, equivalents with, with slight modifications to them. And there are again, like gg half range and also gg gm junction, sorry, um, which uh, plot sort of different um, aspects of transcript annotation and, and that, that we thought also might be useful. Um, but, uh, here we also include a few da uh, data processing helpers, but again, this is just to kind of give a, a, a broad structure of, of the package um, and our thinking behind how we might use and how the kind of building blocks came about. But I think it will like, get a lot clearer when I when I uh, come to show you the actual visualizations. Um, so here, I think um, this is a, a very sort of preliminary vignette. Um, and if there is any other features that end up, you know, you kind of want to be a little bit um, uh, more clear on, I, I can kind of do a, uh, an interactive sort of showing you on, on an R session, um, the, the usage of, of, of a GG transcript if, if it was, uh, if anything's missed. Um, but here really the, the fundamentals were, I asked myself sort of what, what is transcript annotation uh, composed of? 
And but what came to mind was you have your exons, right, in a traditional transcript annotation plot, and you have your introns. And uh, th there was a much more thinking behind why I desire, why uh, GM range and GM intron were the two GMs that we we added. So in reality, GM intro, uh, sorry, GM range is just GM tile, if any of you have ever used it, but instead it's parameterized uh, rather than by an X min max and Y min uh, max, you have a X start and end to match sort of the genetic nomenclature and also a single Y that can be a discrete value, for example, a transcript name. Um, as you can see, uh, this is pretty much just a, an import of an object from a, a GTF filtered by exons and then converted to a data frame. And if you just plop this sort of into your traditional GG plot syntax, uh, you, you get something that looks like uh, ranges that you're kind of getting towards something that looks like a, a, a transcript annotation plot. Um, one of the key uh, advantages of making GG transcript to GG plot extension is that it Kind of inherits all of your sort of traditional syntax that we're all familiar with as well as the flexibility of of the um sort of uh, aesthetics and parameters that the base gg tran uh, gg plot 2 has so for example here uh, for a gm range what we can do is set fill to a in this case transcript biotype which is included in the original data frame and you, you can see that kind of uh, very intuitively, you, you get the, the, the aesthetic functionality uh, that, that you would expect. Then uh, the, the other bit of transcript annotation I think is important is sort of the, the geome introns, right? Um, and here uh, often because transcript annotation is defined usually by axons, for example, in, in a GTF, you don't necessarily carry the introns with you. Um, in, in, in sort of the, those uh, file tough formats. G2's transcript also has a sort of convenient helper function that converts your exons into introns that's uh, called two introns. So you, you put in your exon file that has a start and end in it, and then also the group, uh, for example, in here, you, you would have transcript that could also be gene, but just the name of the column that differentiates uh, the, the exon, exon groups. And this is sort of intended to be helpful for when you come to sort of plot uh, an intron plot, right? Uh, or, or introns into your plot. Um, in, in a sense, you then for, therefore only as an input need to have the exons because you have your two intron helper function. Um, so here I'm just showing like what the base level of, uh, if you add a geom intron, it looks like. Um, by default, the strand arrow is plotted as a plus. But this is also can be used as a, a parameter, obviously, to, to kind of adjust the direction of strand. Um, you can also add this as an aesthetic. So for example, if you map it to the strand column of your, um, of your data frame, and then uh, that's useful if you have uh, transcripts that originate from different strands that you're trying to plot. So you could have one that points uh, on the negative, uh, on the minus kind of direction and the other that uh, points in the positive. Um, so obviously, uh, the, the most, uh, the kind of design or use case of this is really when you use them both together. And so this is sort of the, the um, kind of the GM range that we saw earlier and the GM intron plotted together with the strand parameter set to minus. And uh, you can see that I haven't, um, I've kind of created the introns on the fly here to input as the data into GM intron. So really to start with, or, or for this plot, to trot, plot transcript annotation, you only need to have the exon data. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that you can kind of see from this plot is that when the introns get too small, you have strand arrows that um, um, kind of get plotted overlapping the exons, depending on the kind of relative size of the exon and the intron and um, the, the plot itself. So here we all can also add a, um, uh, a parameter into geom intron called the arrow min <laughs> intron length. Maybe uh, the, the, that, that naming could be improved, but um, essentially what it does is it kind of, uh, you can set a, a length, uh, the minimum length of an intron or upon which an arrow will be plotted. So here, um, if I set it to 500, only introns that are 
above the size of 500 end up having arrows on them. And if you kind of compare this to the, the previous plot, uh, you can see that the, some of these arrows um, that looked a bit messy have now been removed, right? Um, so, so this is sort of the, the I think, the, the kind of core use case, I guess, when people are looking to plot transcript annotation, you can imagine maybe having novel transcripts here that you wanted to compare to, to your known transcripts. Um, I think one thing to mention is that GM range can kind of be used. Uh, the reason it's called GM range instead of GM exon is because I think there are many other range-based annotations um, within transcript annotation. So for example, uh, we've used it for kind of cage seek data before to overlay as another sort of, um, of uh, another Y variable on, on your plot. Um, another uh, kind of uh, common one is to plot the CDS. And here, what, what you can um, traditionally on, on transcript annotation plots, what you have is the, the UTR as being a sort of smaller, but differentiated by being a smaller size, right? Um, here, uh, what, what, what we've done is we've kind of plotted, uh, we've extracted the CDS from the original uh, transcript annotation. Again, this is just a kind of import of a GTF file into a, into a data frame and um, then filtering for the gene GBA. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Um, and then what we do is we, we plot the axons, which will include the UTRs um, originally with yeah. a fill using as white and then uh, maybe a, a slightly smaller height. And then we can use GM range and actually add the CDSs on um, to be the kind of original size. Um, um, here we've kind of just filled it uh, with by, by the transcript, but you, you could kind of play around with that. But then um, uh, we add the introns on and here, uh, th this is the kind of sort of plot you might uh, end up kind of leaning towards. And um, obviously the CDS only kind of, um, uh, is present for protein coding transcripts. So it might make more sense to kind of filter out from the plot uh, the, the, the remaining non-protein coding transcripts if you wanted. Um, but, but that would be kind of pre-processing of the, the input data. Um, but yeah, sorry, I, I kind of just threw this vignette together for, for today. So, so that's the reason that they're, they're kind of still there. Um, to mention uh, some of the other geomes, um, this is there's, there's a geom junction that inherits from a geom curve. I don't know if that that one's popularly used in um, in ggplot2, but I, I I certainly never used it before really. But um, uh, uh, just to to kind of show you what what you could kind of do with geom junction is is really to try and see uh, whether you have junction support for a particular transcript. So. Um, in our use case, what we do is we sort of plot a transcript, a full length transcript structure from long read uh, RNA sequencing. And then from the short read, it's sometimes useful because you have a lot more data that originates from the short read, for example, across different cell types or brain regions. And um, you can kind of compare uh, the short read data to the kind of long read derived transcript to see where that particular transcript might be kind of uh, um, um, uh, across how many individuals across which cell types. And um, it can be helpful to overlay the junction data for, for that use case. Um, similarly to the other geomes, uh, geom junction is also as an extension of ggplot, one you can play around with in terms of um, the aesthetics and the, the parameters. Right, so here you might think about um, mapping a size onto uh, the, the count of the junction. Uh, here is the junctions are purely um, just kind of artificial <laughs> data that I've generated, which is also why they precisely map the in, uh, map to the the known introns. But I hope you can kind of, um, uh, in principle, see 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 the the um, use case. Finally, the, the fourth geom that I've added is, is what's called a geom half range. Um, this was sort of added as one of the, the last ones um, and based off of discussing with some of the people in my lab and uh, thinking about what they might want um, in terms of their own plots. But what this essentially does is, is really, as it says, um, plots half of a range. So, so if you just changed, swapped out geom range here for half range, uh, by default, what you get is that uh, you only get half of the range and it 
by default ends up below uh, the, the, the transcript line, right? Um, sometimes uh, you, you might also switch it, for example, to, to using a parameter called range orientation to, to plot the, the half range on top. Um, one of the use cases that we found for this, that again, uh, for the long read sort of thing is to compare between transcripts, right? Um, uh, obviously <laughs> you can sort of beautify this plot a lot more, but um, essentially you can set, uh, plot two half ranges um, that originate from two different transcripts, one above, one below. Um, uh, if I had a little more time, I'd obviously put the kind of a legend here and the introns in, but um, this can be sort of useful uh, also, what we found it useful for is if you have protein domains that you know the genomic position of, what you can do is plot the transcript, let's say structure in terms of exons on the bottom, and then overlay the um, potential protein domains on top um, and uh, with a legend or something like this. Um, finally, this is a plot that we kind of thought about. <laughs> I don't know, like... This was a, one of the concepts why we introduced GM half range. Uh, now that I've plotted it in reality, I don't know if it works that well, but um, I, I hope that kind of you can see uh, the potential there. You might have to play around with the curvature, which is another um, parameter for the for the GM junctions. Um, but but uh, uh, you can kind of plot the transcript annotation on the bottom and you know keep all that information because it's vertically vertically symmetrical whilst. Um, plotting the junctions on top. So the other couple of things that um, uh, are included in the package are... Uh, um, sorry, so, David. Yeah. Um, on this previous plot. So you know how... Um, oh, you stop screen sharing. Ah, uh, did I? Uh, that was not, not by... I don't think I clicked anything. Um, So one sec. Yeah, is that better? Is that work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, I was just wondering. So this half range, right? Um, function. Um, you can give it a, a height, right? Argument, or I mean something like that. Yeah. 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 Sorry, height over here. Um, um now that is a vector, uh, sorry, a single number, right? Mm -hmm. could, could this be an actual, like, let's say a vector, um, um, for example, if you wanted the bars to reflect, um, like manually, maybe you could calculate um, the mean of the nearby junctions, right? And then use that as the height. Right, mm -hmm. make the high proportional to the to the mean of, of, of the junctions coming in and coming out of it. Mm, that's really cool, actually. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. All right. So it's like a visual depiction of like how prevalent that exon would be expected to be spliced in. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. No, I, so so uh, so from an implementation um, side, height can't be um, uh, mapped to a particular. Um, a static right now. However, it's very easy to, to change that. Um, so I, I could make it just like uh, the way you that- You can vectorize it basically. Yeah, yeah. Like internal to the ggplot side, I'd have to change height from a purely a parameter, which is like set globally on the geome to mm. one that could be in a static, which is mm. mapped to a particular column and also a parameter. But yeah, that, that could be a cool mm. one to do. I'll definitely, I'll, dro I'll drop that down, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, I guess the complete the idea, right? You would have to have like a minimum height so you could see things. And then after that, like it would be proportional, right? <laughs> yeah, right so yeah, like yeah. A, a, zero, a zero of counts would still give you a bit of height. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you would, you would need to write a bit of, I mean, a user would need to write a bit of code, right? To compute that minimum. And then, but then after that, make um, the rest of the height proportional to. to yeah, the, I think. For that use case, Just, what please, you... before you go before you guys go down that rabbit hole, I need to know from the junction side, from a biological standpoint, making the differences in the junction make sense. From the exon side, that does not. Uh, you you want the exon to be the exact same shape because it's actually just an annotation for the gene. It's not showing how much 
that exon is expressed. That should be a color. Uh, so yeah. if you wanted to show that was higher expressed or low expressed, then do like a, a heat map color thing for the exon, but don't mm. change the height of the exon because mm. that's an annotation. And I think I was just gonna say it after you're done it might be a better idea to not use range, maybe feature, because what you're really doing is plotting different features. So like, if you want to say G feature for like genomic feature, and then it encompasses a bunch of different things, because when I think of range, I'm not thinking of a genetic, a genomic feature intuitively. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, you just, you do want to be somewhat careful uh, about yeah. like language when you're, outside the population well that comes yeah, from that... ranges right sorry yeah, i realized that is from r you have g ranges class right so i suppose it, it kind of kicks in there very well <laughs> it fits there yeah I, I i take your point there but both sides and also on the on the kind of not changing the exon size i think that that does actually probably make sense to, to keep that static and use a color i think yeah on the range i don't know i think Personally, I guess like my intuition was that range, probably because uh, <laughs> working with the genomic ranges so much that it was sort of uh, uh, embedded in my <laughs> like um, like vocabulary that range uh, was one of these things. But I do take your point that probably someone coming yeah, out. Yeah, they change of that. that to G range for a reason. It's not yeah. range because it's the range. It's a G range. But I'm not sure you want to put G range here. Uh, I still don't understand why they bother yeah. calling it G range, but I'm not, I'm not in that space. I, but what yeah. people are doing, they're plotting features at a specific position. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, I could, I could think about changing it to feature as well. Yeah. I think G range could be nice, but also it gets into a little bit of a, I don't know, complication because Technically, obviously, ggplot takes as input data frames, right? And I haven't like changed that, and I think that's probably very complicated to change as a someone that's just extending the the, the original yeah. ggplot. So, if I put g range, someone might get confused that the input could be like a, a g an actual g range is is what my thought was. Um, but yeah, I think features could work. I mean, I, I'd be happy to do sort of like a poll here <laughs> and see what people prefer. Uh, just to you know, to to because otherwise, yeah, I like um, kind of take the one that pleases the most people. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it did also take me a minute to understand what you meant by half range. You mean mm -hmm. you're just plotting half of the feature, right? Yeah, you're kind just, of just moving the center. It's like an off-centered. Yeah, that's correct. Just. just I guess in general, that this would be the, the original plot. Um, and when we look at kind of transcript annotation, it's always vertically symmetrical, right? Um, and I don't think m many people have done this, to be honest, because when, when you cut it, it doesn't. Um, but but I, I thought uh, it could be a, a nice idea, like um, if if you wanted to plot something on top that, that was like represent matching the genetic coordinates, it would free up some space. Uh, yeah, it's not a bad idea um, for novel transcript annotation, so you can see exactly differences if they're small, but yeah. like if they're that small, I don't know, but it, it's not a bad idea, but yeah, including like, junction stuff is probably more important. Uh, mm. like, uh, visualizing splicing, because most of the time you just have to go to the IGV browser to visualize and print out splicing and stuff like that. Uh, I guess uh, if you combine it with colors, right, you can plot different things, right? Like the top half range could, even if you do like the full range, right? But the top half could be, you know, like the, a heat map of the incoming entrance. The bottom one could be an, a heat map of the outcoming, sorry, incoming junctions, outcoming junctions. Mm, stuff like that or um or like i don't know like splicing noise metrics that you have right yeah 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 mm -hmm. yeah for, for sure yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's like a completely like different function from your GM, uh, just GM range, but could you make like half, like an argument of GM range, like half equals top, half equals bottom or something like, or I don't know if that would be like too complicated, but I feel like it would make more sense as a user if that was all in one spot, because it essentially does the same thing. It just where it plots. Um, yeah, that's no, that, that, to be honest, um, geo, like from an implementation standpoint, GM half range inherits from GM range mm -hmm. and then has the default V, V just and height changed. So the V okay. just moves the block to the bottom and then the height has to be halved as well from the normal GM range. So essentially it's just, you're changing the sort of parameters of GM range. So you could definitely make that an argument instead of GM range. Yeah, I, th I see what you mean. Um, yeah, I get like, yeah, I'm very like, I, I'm open to changing that, to be honest. I think, um, you think it would kind of make more intuitive sense to set something like, uh, I, I don't know, the parameter, let's call it half or something, half and then equals top or equals bottom. Uh, yeah, I would say so. And top, bottom, like, or full. Huh? Yeah. yeah, then the default would be full. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah, yeah. Both. I don't know. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I'll, I'll, I think I'll change that. I think it makes sense. Um, one, one other thing, which is probably very small, but technically what you're plotting in Geom Junction is actually a splicing event and not an actual, you're, you're plotting, it's like it, where, the, would it, where it ends and begins, that is the junction. So when you connect the two, that is a technically a splicing event just like when you're thinking about that from a biological standpoint i don't know if the people who use this will be like well are we planning each individual junction or each individual splicing event mm, i see um because we we use junctions a lot when we talk about exon exon junctions because we're talking about from here to here but tech technically one junction is not from one place to the other. It's technically a splicing event. It's like it's like tomatoes and tomatoes. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah, I guess from the perspective of like designing the API, probably I at least my current thinking was to keep or the the metric for deciding I was gonna prioritize sort of what would that what term would make sense to most people, like uh, intuitively as this is, for example, without having looked at the plot, what would GM junction do? Um, I guess what you're saying is GM splicing event could be, I, or trio. I think that the people who are gonna use it will probably understand what junction means because most people yeah. who do their own plotting actually do not have that much biology. Sometimes they have a bit, but understanding like the underlying difference is just gonna go right over their head. It's yeah. in general, there's plenty yeah. of people who know a lot of biology who also do their own plots and they'll just laugh or talk to somebody's working group and say something. But I, I, I think you're probably fine. But is like cool. a, a thought when you're considering some of the names? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I really appreciate that feedback. It's the, it's the reason I wanted to, to kind of present today, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, sorry, may I, I mean, I could wait for the maybe the end of the presentation. I really had some uh, comments and a pushback on just what KJ just said, but because I think what you did here is brilliant and we really want junction uh, the way it is there. I mean, like sashimi plots and how we see in all the other, you know, support for junction is really for one side, for to one side to the other, you know, both splice events uh, for most uh, use cases that I guess you also encounter. Uh, but yeah, I don't know, maybe you want to finish and I would like to provide some feedback on that or the last Sure, day. sure. I, I, I don't have too much left, so I'll, I'll maybe <laughs> I'll quickly finish in uh, another couple, few minutes and yeah, happy to take any, any other comments. Um, so the, the other two uh, bits that I wanted to mention is a couple of kind of helper functions. Um, the first is to diff and um, again in this uh, sort of preliminary thing there, I haven't described it, but really what it does is um, kind of try to help visualize the differences between transcripts. Um, and here, for example, 
it, what we've done is we've extracted the the main select transcript, um, which is sometimes a reference that you would want to compare to, and then um, we take uh, another few of the other transcripts. But maybe uh, imagine that it, you've got a scenario where you've detected sort of three novel transcripts here, but obviously uh, in this vignette they're, they're, they're kind of annotated ones. And what you can do is use two diff to compare the exons from the, the other transcripts uh, to uh, the main select or one particular reference. Um, and it will produce a sort of start end of where the differences are. Um, if, we, if we plot this, just um, kind of uh, using GM range again with the diffs as the data, right? Um, that, that were produced by two diffs. Um, um, and and uh, what you can see is that uh, the main select being on the bottom uh, sorry, this is maybe I'll put, I put the name name wrong, but what what it does? Sorry, th this one should be the. Um, sorry, I should have checked this. But but what it's <laughs> I I guess what it's done is it's compared it to there's something in the syntax above it is an error code, but uh, in this case what it's done is. It's compared it to to this uh, the other three transcripts to this transcript, but the label of main should should be flipped. Or uh, I've got one of the labels wrong here. But what's happened is, if you imagine that uh, this transcript is the main, then it's found the 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 differences that are not in the reference, right? In each transcript that are highlighted in blue, right? These are extra UTR regions, and then there's bits that are. Um, uh, within the reference that aren't found within those transcripts, right? Um, I hope in principle that makes sense. I would need to go back and check the syntax and also check the implementation of 2D, though, though I have tested it. So I'm hoping it's just a, a plotting plotting thing here. Um, the, the other thing here is that um, there's a helper called Shorten Gaps, which um, is a use case that we found when you have really long introns for a plot. Um, the, the example isn't the best one here because the introns aren't that big, but um, what you can, what, what Shorten Gaps does implementation wise is within, uh, let's say the starting plot, it finds the gaps. So the gaps are those that are defined by, they don't overlap um, an existing um, at, uh, exon. And um, in this case, shortens the, um, those gaps into uh, uh, a fixed width. So here, for example, um, um, you're, you, I, I've, I've shortened uh, the target width to 100, right? Um, in, in a simple plot with only one transcript, the gaps that don't overlap an intron, uh, sorry, don't overlap an exon will be equal to the introns, right? But obviously this gets a lot more complicated when you have uh, multiple transcripts and you get sections where exons will overlap from, from one transcript, overlap the intron of another, and therefore the gap ends up being this sort of uh, region here. I mean, it was, this was sort of a complicated uh, problem to, to implement, to be honest, uh, more complicated than I realized when I set out to do it. But um, uh, hopefully uh, I, I've got the implementation right after some testing. And what you can see is that um, after the gaps are um, uh, kind of shortened, you can see the exons a little bit more clearly, and also uh, everything else is rescaled to preserve the alignment of exons, right? Um, so, so you can still compare the transcript structures um, kind of uh, intuitively. What, one thing to note is that importantly, the output of, of shortened gaps should um, not only be used, sorry, should only be used for visualization because the actual rescale coordinates will not map back to the um, genomic coordinates. Um, so really it's for, uh, again, this use case isn't demonstrating. I should, uh, in the final minute, I'll provide a better example, but you get sort of um, uh, exons that are kind of, uh, sorry, introns that take up basically the entire plot and your exons become lines, right? On, on some genes when the relative um, intron size is so big. And for those, it does become important like much more um, intuitively so to, to kind of shorten these gaps. Um, but yeah, I think that was uh, the, the end of what I've currently implemented in GG Transcript. Happy to take your mm. questions. I was looking at, at this one, um, like um, I see, for example, like 
Oh, I'm not annotating. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I misclicked and, and stopped you from screen sharing. Uh, no worries, no worries. I'll come back one sec. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Sorry. There's this button called the stop remote support that is just below the annotated one, and I clicked it accidentally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I was looking at this one over here, right? Um, yeah. Because there's an X and in the in between of it, and I guess um, that becomes the top one becomes this one. Yeah. Right. And yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. and Sorry, then, let me uh, let me go to the actual because I can zoom in there more. This is uh, using an example uh, mm -hmm. on the um, the the function, so I, I think it's it's easier to um to see it here but uh yeah that's probably better um but mm -hmm. i think you were referring to these two exons right um and they get shortened to these two um yeah that's yeah. correct so the, the alignment preservation that i was talking about is that this exon will always still match up to these exons mm -hmm. right um, mm -hmm. as it does up here, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for example, in, it's, it's also clear with sort of this small transcript mm -hmm. here, it matches up to the boundaries of these two exons and it still does in the rescale transcript. Um, um, yeah, it's something I guess that, yeah, no, I, I see it. Uh, I see how it works well. Um, Maybe I it's think, just a suggestion, but uh, if you if you go back, sorry. Sorry. Me, um, sorry. I just want to show you. This is where kind of this functionality was a little bit inspired from, right? Um, this is what I kind of need <laughs> in the big net, but um, and he only does it for one transcript, right? But you can see, for example, if you plot it to genomic region sort of scale, you can't see the exons really of this particular transcript and uh, if you rescale them you, you can see a lot more clearly um yeah mm -hmm. so. yeah yeah no that's that's great i love it um this is just one suggestion but like visually for me it's a bit hard to like tell whether like this mm. all of these ones are like um aligned um or not right so you know how like um in like our studio you have now the uh, the per the an option for coloring the parentheses, right? So maybe one option would be like, hey, like if this is if these are the exact mm. same ends, then they have the same color, right? And if they if they're like if, if, if they're just like one base apart, right? Then you use a different color because uh, you wouldn't. It's really hard even with this um, short gaps to like tell tell apart like a one base pair difference. And visually, I couldn't really know if these are all in the same line or not. Like mm. my eyes were like, eh, I'm not so sure. I'm not I'm not sure, right? Even here, right? Like on the rescale one, just because like because um, this one is bigger than the than these guys, right? It makes me think. Sometimes my 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 eyes are like, oh, maybe it's actually shifting <laughs> to the right, the, the top yeah. one. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I completely get what you mean. I think. Um, just mm. to illustrate how much I, I empathize with this situation. Um, in, in the actual, like, um, when I was checking whether the, uh, the, the test of this worked, right? <laughs> I had the exact same problem, right? I'm trying to test it based on the plot and visually looking at it instead of like, you know, manually going through uh, the, the data frame, sorry. Um, but um, what, what, what uh, kind of happened was that, uh, it's going to come up with a lot of things, but um, I, I ended up having to implement this like function that compares the before and after, but I added a, a label parameter, right, to actually see whether um, everything was um, um, kind of kind of looking. I'll, I'll do it for the for the smaller one, but uh, so here. <laughs> do you see what I mean? Is that I couldn't tell either, and the only way I could tell is by actually like looking at this. Obviously, this is for the um, 
the one without, uh, sorry, the test without, but um, yeah. Um, thinking about Leo's suggestion, could you turn those labels into like categorical vector that you could color then? I know that color is such a pain to coordinate in ggplot sometimes, but like I do like Leo's idea. I think it would be visually useful. Yeah. Like this is, this is a little overwhelming. I think that like, yeah. you know, if there is a blue line that matches up all these like 2120s here, that would be nice. But I know that that is probably. <laughs> um, no. Yeah, I take your And points. the colors oh. to work it can be a, a struggle. So yeah. Yeah, like even here in your example, you can see, right? There's these guys. So it's like the, this one is 48. The other ones are 45. Yeah, I, yeah. I didn't even notice that, like just looking at it. Yeah, no, completely. I agree. Mm. Um, yeah, no, I, I can try and add something like what you're suggesting, like colors on the edges to to match it. Um, I'll see how, how it is to implement that. Uh, I, I think it's possible, but it's, it's, uh, it might be a bit tr tricky. Yeah, I think it's it would be tricky to not run out of colors, like even this example, mm. like going across, it would be. Yeah, but yeah, I, I think it would be doable and cool if you could get it to work, but I mean, yeah, the colors look they, though, yeah. they, if just there are some huge genes like the Deschamps, the Deschamps. anyway it, some of them have more than a hundred transcripts and set like several thousand like several hundred exons in them you're not gonna <laughs> if, I, I don't if, i don't think the colors have to be unique across all of the plot right they just mm. like like in a in yeah. a vertical area, like have, have you, yeah, like if it went from ID? yeah, you could like you know use the little like whole vidra scale like every like hundred or something, and I think you could tell the difference. That would be maybe how I would do it. Like yeah, so yeah, from like, like exon here to here. IDs, exon IDs are you are not unique to each transcript. They're unique to like the main transcript unless they're novel. So theoretically, one each each one of these that are the exact same size, those have their unique exon IDs. Okay. Um, if they're in the same size in the same position. So if you're looking at yeah the yeah top, no, I... so you can theoretically yeah. color by exon ID. I don't know how well that would work, but that is technically an annotation that are in most GTF. Uh, files. Well, I th yes. <laughs> Sorry, I think that was actually about the uh, supply sites, right? Uh, coloring by by, and that should be could be easily done around the range. We can specify a range where to assign unique colors. You know, I guess depending on the zoom level, I, I suppose the range can be adjusted. But uh, indeed, the uniqueness for a uh, acceptor or donor site, right, should be. My color should be really only be in a limited range. We don't care about exons and stuff like that, I suppose. It just if they have yeah. different coordinates, they should get around a very limited range uniqueness. I Leo, Leo suggested that earlier. I think that was the idea, right? To just yeah. consider local uniqueness. It, yeah. it looks like there was two kind of issues. One is what you are talking about, where you have these exons that are at the same location but slightly different sizes. Uh, but then you have at the other side where you're actually looking at different exons, but they look like they're the same exon. That's that's that, that it's technically not the same exon if it's in a different location. Um, yeah, but this but, junction location that matters really. I mean, I think for um, yeah. But if we're hiding, if you're highlighting a junction location, maybe you should just annotate it on the plot and not even color it. If you can do like a square or a triangle or a star on the plot. And then you don't have to worry about colors. You can use like a symbol, but yeah. Yeah, no, I think they're all good ideas. I do like the color one. And I think it's uh, like the way that whether that gets implemented basically will be a, a matter of like whether I have enough time. But obviously right now, the simplest case is like people can like zoom in, right? Cause it's ggplot. They'll do a like chord cartes and then set the limits to where they're really interested in like the region that might be different or not different and then <laughs> check where the boundaries are like visually mapping in the zoomed plot so um 
so let yeah I, i'll try and i think about how to to add the but i definitely understand where, where you guys are coming from yeah i think i think you said you had some some um some comments to you Oh yeah, uh, sorry. So first of all, I, I can't tell you how how exciting I am, how excited I am about what you just did there and then discovered this morning when I wrote the presentation, what's about. I look I work a lot with transcript assembly, right? Exactly your use case, I suppose. I mean, seeing a lot of novel transcripts, long read assemblies, you know, with the transcript assemblers, right? Um, and this is I was looking for something like this for uh, over a year, I think, uh, in R and I use something like gvs for that i guess you know to, mm, to yeah. gtfs and by the way looking i ran uh, your example this uh, this morning uh, before this um, and of course it's so fast and exactly what i wanted to, to show a cluster <laughs> wow. a cluster of transcripts on the um on the uh, yeah uh, the whole thing uh, so uh, and using gvs is, is a pain of course it's uh, has very it's very heavy but yeah, um, yeah. yeah, this was exactly what I was looking for. And I want to push back on the earlier comments with the heights also. I mean, the half range, I think it's perfect to compare indeed to transcript structure. <laughs> and, and what Leo suggested was very good to vectorize the height would show, mm -hmm. I mean, for example, in string, string tie output has uh, Exxon coverage, uh, yeah. Exxon for the produced novel, uh, the output uh, transcripts, right? The novel transcripts have Exxon level coverage. And that would look, so interesting to have these heights, like a very uh, low resolution um, transcript um, uh, co coverage plot, right? Essentially, just by exon, right? When you have many exons, you can see the exon coverage by heights. That would be a great feature. The only thing I think is missing, and maybe the rainbow coloring, like uh, for the uh, splice sites, uh, that was another great suggestion. But other than that, I think this is absolutely great. Yeah, and uh, actually, yeah, uh, KJ has. I was wondering how hard it would be to add a coverage plot somehow. I mean, if you can load a, a read file or something, I mean, I realize that's kind of a, an advanced feature. Uh, I think right now, yeah, no. But thanks so much for your feedback, by the way, just uh, before I kind of get into that question. I think it's super nice to, to see, and I'm, I'm really glad that people like, that, that kind of you, you uh, kind of have the use case and it does work as you want it to. That's a, a really great feedback. And I, I'd love to kind of hear more if you do end up using it and kind of let, do kind of, you know, either submit an issue or just, you know, let me know uh, on Slack if if there's something that um, you think could be cool to be added, because I, I think uh, you're pretty, well, we have very similar use cases. So we're kind, I'm kind of designing for the use case, but it would be cool to see, you know, uh, from your experience, if there's anything else. Um, on, on the coverage plot to make it like a full sashimi is, it is something I thought about, but I don't know how best to incorporate it um, from an implementation uh, standpoint. Sorry, uh, the, the, the reason being is because, so th there's kind of a trade-off uh, where, I've made the the y-axis like a discrete value, right? Um, so now, uh, if I want to add a coverage plot, that sort of is intuitively the yeah numerical value, right? Um, so it's kind of hard to uh, think of it of how it could overlay nicely onto this from a kind of perspective of how you often see sashimi plots. What I was thinking is you could, for example, kind of add one, you know, uh, and like patchwork it or like, you know, GG arrange it onto the kind of two plots, like one vertically on top of the other. Um, I, I don't know if you have any other ideas about that, but that's how I was um, thinking about it. Basically to have a coverage plot, but as a sort of, you know, um, a G, like a, a, a kind of a coverage track, like a line plot that would be arranged on top of this. Uh, plot. Outside of like vectorizing the height, making the height the coverage. I, I don't. I don't know. Um, yeah, I could try that. I mean, the height, vectorizing the height, or making yeah, making it aesthetic is something I'll, I'll definitely do. Um, but I mean, I, have to, I guess I have to stop and say that this is pretty cool. It's well, well needed gap, especially for like transcript um, and novel transcript stuff. There's the stuff we have to use now. It's, I, literally, I had to 
go to a genome browser, print it out, and then annotate by hand each one in a box for my dissertation, okay? Because I had to have it, we had nothing for it. So, you know, just having an Exxon annotation that you can color, <laughs> right then you're filling a huge gap. <laughs> it, uh, so adding junction annotations, like literally if you got the junction annotation stuff and the coloring, that that's a package that people could use right away. That, I mean, you don't have to do anything more than that. Um, even looking at the difference, if you can get it to color the differences, that I would say that is a lot for looking and comparing novel transcripts and the transcripts you find. That's literally all I would need uh, for some of the stuff I would have loved to have. <laughs> No, yeah, that sounds, <laughs> I'm really happy to hear that. Yeah, I mean, I felt the same way, right? <laughs> is, is kind of the, the feeling. Um, for, based on that, what, one thing that I, I kind of um, just wanted to ask you guys is, I've been floating back and forth on this sort of geo. It could also be kind of as uh, Louise was um, um, suggesting for the GM half range, uh, kind of a, a parameter rather than a separate geo within GM junction. but. Um, basically a label to label sort of the center of the, the junction with counts, right? Right now you can only set it as sort of an aesthetic and it's kind of useful, but it's also, it's not precise, right? To, to, to kind of see what the count of the junction is. I, I, basically this will take like some time to implement. And I was wondering how useful you guys would find something like this. But it would be like a, a label in the center of a junction, let's say with GM label repel that kind of marks the count. Um, so like there'd be I, like a little number floating up here. Uh, I can't see the up here, oh. but, but I, yeah. Yeah, just like above your little arc, like um, like right in the middle. Um, yes, exactly. Like, you know, number yes. 10 or something. Um, or an ID yeah. maybe, right? Yeah, yeah, like this. Um, okay. Yeah, I think that could be useful. Um, I could see I how it could get really tricky when you have little tiny, you know, not a lot of space, which, you know, is always like the issue with labels. So like the repel, um, yeah. But yeah, that could be, that, that, that could be neat. Um, but what yeah. about filtering out low junctions so that hmm. you're only plotting junctions that have an X number of support? Yeah, I know that like geom label has like you can set if and statement or like if else um, statements within like geom. I know just geom label. Um, so you know if you're like if counts are below uh, fifty or whatever, don't label. Um, like could be you know a way to get around that. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, what would it be I, I, for though? Just to show that one junction has a lot versus another, because it's more like a, yeah. It, that, that's kind of it, yeah. That, that, that's the conclusion I came to is like, it might not be like an essential thing and it will also get really messy with sort of complicated um, plots. Basically, I was kind of going to leave it until like someone raised an issue and <laughs> said that they're really looking for something like this. And then I can kind of see that, you know, there's a clear use case for it. I think they label some of them in, in snap count, right? Or, or sorry, Snaptron, the Snaptron UI interface, right? I think some of them are labeled. Um, but um, yeah. Um, regarding like the coverage, I just thought like, uh, with like ggbio, right? ggbio has this tracks function and like one of the tracks can be an actual like ggplot. So potentially you don't need to like, worry too much about coverage and stuff. Mm. You can leave it to other packages and just um, like maybe I would just test if, if you can use um, the result from what you get with like the tracks function from ggbio, right? Mm. Um, I don't know if like a wig, wiggle plot R has um, equivalent of that, um, but yeah, um, uh, or maybe uh, ggvis, right? But uh, in any case, ggbio. Tracks is a function I've used in the past myself. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, I'll try that. And I mean, I'll add it to the vignette as a kind of use case if, if it works out. Well, I'll try and make it work out if it doesn't. But yeah, I think mm -hmm. it'll be good. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, no. Uh, are you going to present it at Bioconductor, maybe? Because um, abstract submissions for Bioconductor are, are like uh, March. I was 9th. actually uh, so so. I was thinking like whether to submit it to Cran or Bioconductor. The natural like avenue is obviously Bioconductor, but there's some like sort of uh, the the way that ggplot2 is written internally and the way that you have to extend it makes sort of you have to go against some of like the bioc check related things for example like functions being less than 50 lines long and like that's a that's I, a note that's not that's a note that's not a warning or an error that's true yeah right. yeah on bioc check yeah. so you can get away with that okay yeah yeah yeah. I, I, mean, okay, the, I, I mean, if you have it on Bioconductor, right, it gets tested every day on the three operating systems. If you have it on CRAN, it just gets tested when you submit it. Mm. All right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll go for Bioconductor then. It's just that last time I, when I submitted a package, the, I think, I don't know who was reviewing mine, but they asked me to remove all notes, <laughs> like before he would look at it kind of thing. So um, I just kind of hope that that doesn't happen. <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It might be possible. You can always, you can, you can always like, um, you know, mention Argument. like, hey, like we try to like minimize as many notes, but like, I have this thing, or like in my case, I've gone in a way with warnings, right? For like, I oh, really, yeah, I really need to do this, and uh, you justify it, and then they, you might get away with. It. So yeah, I know. It's, yeah, yeah. No, I'm sure. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Sorry, I realized I had another, uh, if, if I can make uh, one more comment. I realized this morning when I tried this package, uh, uh, it, I was trying to find a way like uh, what I did it be before, like when I used GVs, how to load uh, my own GTF. And I think it would be nice to have an example there because many packages uh, that I looked at before, <laughs> before discovering yours today, uh, they don't really tell you how to you know, they use mm. annotations and stuff. I saw that you have an example there and I mean, no, no, the method is R track layer, right? That's how the best GFF yeah. loader that I've found in R, right? I don't think there's an, an, a better one, GTF loader or GFF, right? Um, anyway, this, uh, it would be nice to have a workflow example there, how to load a custom G GFF that's increase the accessibility of the package, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Absolutely. Uh, do, do you think that should be a kind of, my personal preference would just be to kind of put it in a vignette as an example, but do you think yeah. it warrants a, like a whole wrapper in the, in the oh. actual... <laughs> to make it a requirement? Like, no, probably like, not. No, yeah, because then you'd have to add R-track layers of dependency, which uh, maybe it's not worth that kind of cost at this stage. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, yeah. Genomic features is supposed to have the wrappers, right, for reading GFFs and like custom stuff. So like, I would just leave it as part of the vignette, not as... Right, right, cool. yeah, yeah. yeah, that is just, yeah. just in there. And actually, the, you mentioned earlier that you cannot, uh, doesn't seem easy to use uh, directly a, a G range is a list or something like that. But uh, apparently, the look at the table that you have there for the example, right? Uh, it looks like uh, you can uh, convert to a data frame uh, G ranges, and those are the M calls there. It looks like very straightforward that could be done like that. That's how the R track layer actually loads uh, the GFF or GTF as a G ranges object with the meta data co columns. So maybe yeah. and also an example of, I don't know, could, could be also in the vignette, something like that, how to get the G ranges objects, which is actually coming from R track layer in this case, it's directly from the example. So it could be the same thing. I yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah you're, that makes sense. I'll do that for sure. I is think. That Genomic ranges has the as data frame converter for a G ranges object, right? And if you need it to be a table, right? Then you would just do like it's, table it, on, it, on the as data frame of a G ranges, right? Yeah. So yeah, no, I think the, the input data, like it could, uh, what I meant as the difficulty earlier is that it's hard to make a ggplot function take a G ranges object. Um, because it expects a data frame or a tibble. And I think that's kind of like, it will be, I don't know, <laughs> like it feels something very daunting to try and address. So, uh, but I, I think for sure I can show the vignette that it's a very easy sort of as data frame into the, uh, something that is kind of um, usable in the ggplot functions, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could even show that also in examples, right? 
Yeah. 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 Because yeah. I think I think that will be a very common scenario. Yeah. Like you pointed out. Yeah. 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 No. Plus, it will be nice for the biconductor submission to say, like, hey, this is you know linked to biconductor packages type of thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 I don't actually know if like the tidy bulk or, or tidy summarize experiment, if any of those packages have something that could be useful for you. Um, but it feels like not really because you're just doing the as data frame on the G range. That, yeah, I have basically no experience with any of those packages. Um, so yeah. I can have a look if you think yeah. it's like um like the way I understand the work is like you have a summarized experiment object. Um, but then um, the internals of the object don't change, but you can visit, vis you can see it in like a long format type of thing where you have like um, a column for like gene expression, let's say, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then write code that is more like, um, like tidy R type of, sorry, deep plier type of code, right? Uh, I see. Uh, without I actually see. changing the internal object. Uh, um, Understand, yeah. Kind of like plier ranges. Is that right? Is one of the other ones? Yes. But yeah, so I get what you uh, mean. I guess pipe range would be the one that is more useful to your scenario, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Plight ranges is a package that like converts G ranges objects into into like um, table objects, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I mean, I I would need to check more of that package. Yeah. Yeah. But cool. Cool. Awesome. This was, this was great, David. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. It's it's a uh, it's always great to to have people that are interested in the the functionality of what you're building, right? Um, but yeah, genuinely, if you guys have any more feedback, like um, kind of just you know message me on Slack or or, or post an issue, that'd be really like I'll probably still be developing this for the next month or so. So I'm happy to incorporate anything. Cool. Awesome. Really cool. Right. Cool. Thanks, guys. See you. Thank you. Have a good uh, weekend. Yeah, you too. You too. Bye. Bye.